In the headlines, Korea now has a new prime minister. After much political wrangling, former ruling party four leader Lee Kuan Yew takes the country's number two job. Chinese and Japanese investors buy a near $7 billion worth of Korean shares and bonds last year, an all-time high not seen since the 2009 global financial crisis. The European Union places sanctions on more Russians and Ukrainians, accusing them of threatening Ukraine's independence just days after a ceasefire was announced. Primetime News begins now. Welcome to the program. You're watching Primetime News live from Seoul. I'm Sean Lim. And I'm Lee Ji-yoon filling in for Kang Chae-ri. Thanks so much for joining us tonight. Korea now has a new prime minister after much political wrangling over whether or not the nominee was fit for the job. However, Lee won gu has a lot of hurdles to jump over as he takes on his new role, with the first one being winning back the public's trust. Our Ji myung gil has the story for us tonight. Newly elected Prime Minister Lee Wan Gu now holds the country's second highest position. With him in place, President Park Geun-hye can focus on carrying out a cabinet reshuffle and move forward with her policies aimed at economic revitalization and helping the working people. However, the main opposition party and the public speculate that E may become a vegetated prime minister, as many see him as unqualified for the job. Since his confirmation hearing last week, Yi has been under intense fire for allegations of ethical lapses, including real estate speculation and draft dodging. Although Yi passed a parliamentary confirmation vote through overwhelming support from his ruling party members, he now bears some heavy responsibilities relating to state affairs. Prime Minister Yi will be tasked with reforming the pension system for civil servants, rooting out corruption among public officials and restructuring the labor market. Once the presidential office carries out a small reshuffle based on his recommendations, Yi will have to show his strength to control and lead the cabinet. The new prime minister will also have to foster an atmosphere where the presidential office, the National Assembly and the government can smoothly communicate with one another to better coordinate policies. As Yi is a member of the pro Park Geun-hye faction and the former floor leader of the ruling Senuri party, political analysts expect Yi can act as a bridge for talks. Prime Minister Yi has said he would do his part in maintaining cooperation between all governmental parties and in particular uphold relations with the main opposition in order to create bipartisanship to push forward with state affairs. Kim young Arirang News. During her meeting with the Unification Preparatory Committee on Monday, President Park Geun-hye talked about ways to draw in investments from around the world, as unification comes with a hefty price tag. For more on this meeting, here's our Choi Yoo-sun. President Park Geun-hye, who has said a unified Korea will offer a bonanza to the peninsula, says a unification roadmap should be drawn up to include benefits not only for the two Koreas, but the world. By attracting international attention to investment opportunities in a unified Korea, the president expects to offset anticipated unification costs. President Park's envisioned blueprint would include overseas funding for social overhead capital and resources development in the north. At the same time, the president urged Pyongyang to take note of countries like Mongolia, Vietnam and Myanmar, which have carried out reforms and opened up their markets to the outside world. With regards to Pyongyang's nuclear ambitions, President Park said Seoul and the international community should continue to persuade the North to change its course and explain how unification would benefit both Koreas. Choi Yoo-sun, Arirang News. 
If he were alive, late North Korean leader Kim Jong-il would have been 73 today. Nevertheless, the regime celebrated Kim's birthday, complete with fireworks and festivities. There was even a show of tribute by current leader Kim Jong-un to his father and grandfather. Our Hwang Sung-hee tells us more. Lavish firework displays color the skies of Pyongyang. It's part of the grand festivities commemorating the 73rd birthday of late former leader Kim Jong-il. Dubbed the Day of the Shining Star, it is one of the country's biggest holidays, along with the birthday of the nation's founder, Kim Il-sung, known as the Day of the Sun. The event, broadcast via state media on Monday, shows Pyongyang residents watching the fireworks over the Taedonggang River. North Korea watchers say fireworks have become more common in Pyongyang since Kim Jong-un came into power. The young Kim visited Kim Su-san Palace of the Sun at midnight to pay tribute to his father and grandfather. He was accompanied by key military officials, including director of the Korean People's Army, Hwang byung seo But his wife Lee seol ju and sister Kim Yo-jung were absent from the crowd, just like last year. By visiting the Kim Su-san Palace with only key military officials, Kim Jong-un is trying to show that he has taken over the military while also upholding the country's military first policy and establishing one-man leadership. Despite earlier speculation about the potential for military provocations by North Korea to mark the day of the shining star, no such signs have been detected. Hwang sung Arirang News. China and Japan are becoming more aggressive when it comes to investing in Korea, which is suffering from sluggish growth and low prices. These countries' combined net buying of Korean shares and bonds last year hit a high not seen since the 2009 global financial crisis. Here's our Kim Min-ji with more. Foreign capital, especially from China and Japan, is pouring into the Korean financial market. According to the Financial Supervisory Service, Chinese and Japanese investors bought a net 6.7 billion U.S. dollars worth of Korean shares and bonds last year. That's more than double from 2013 and an all-time high since the watchdog first began compiling such data in 2009. Experts say while other countries have been cautious when it comes to Korea, which has been suffering from slow growth and low prices, China and Japan have been aggressive in tapping into the market. Last year, Japanese investors bought a net $2.8 billion worth of shares on the Seoul Bourse, while Chinese investors bought a net $1.8 billion in shares. Combined, it's a significant number considering that the total net purchases made by foreigners came to $5.7 billion. On the bond market, Chinese investors bought a net $2 billion in bonds last year, becoming the largest investor. In terms of bond holdings, China ranks second, trailing behind the United States. Experts say the inflow of capital from the two neighboring nations can be attributed to China's rapid economic growth and Japan's quantitative easing programs. Kim min Arirang News. Well, major economies around the world are loosening their monetary policies, which analysts believe could lead to what they call an unspoken currency war. And back here in Korea, all eyes are on whether or not the country's central bank will follow the path of its global counterparts. Our Hwang Jae tells us more. So far this year, 17 countries and the European Central Bank have eased their monetary policies either by lowering their key interest rates or introducing quantitative easing programs. Canada, Switzerland and 11 emerging economies like India and China are in this race, which comes as the countries try to prop up their ailing domestic economies. Now pressure for further monetary easing by Korea's central bank is piling up. 
But analysts say it's unlikely the central bank will take action on Tuesday. This month's monetary policy meeting is taking place right before the Lunar New Year holiday, and the central bank has not signaled a rate cut. So we'll keep the rate unchanged for this month. Korea's finance minister Che Kyung Han also emphasized last week that it's more important to push through structural reforms than to debate over a rate cut. Still, analysts expect a rate cut to take place sometime in the second quarter this year. The Korean economy is not showing signs of momentum for a solid recovery so far this year, just like in the fourth quarter of last year. To give a much-needed boost to the economy, the central bank is expected to cut the rate in April or May before the U.S. Federal Reserve starts to raise its key interest rate. Korea's low inflation rate is also giving the central bank room to trim its key interest rate. Consumer prices were running below the BOK's 2.5 to 3.5 percent inflation target ban for more than two years in January. Some analysts say, however, that the central bank will not join the global move toward monetary easing, as there's no clear sign of it affecting the local financial market. Hwang Jie, Arirang News. Korea and Japan have no plans to renew their 14-year currency swap deal amid a breakdown in bilateral relations. Korea's finance ministry announced Monday that the last outstanding currency swap deal between Seoul and Tokyo worth $10 billion will expire next Monday as scheduled and that they have made no further arrangements for a future deal. This was widely expected as diplomatic relations between the two countries have cooled over Japan's territorial claims to Korea's Tokto Island. In addition, Korea's need for the extra cushion provided by the deal has decreased as it has abundant foreign reserves backed by a strong current account surplus. There's a wind of change blowing through the global auto industry. Many of the world's leading automakers are pulling factory operations out of emerging markets and putting them back in their home countries. Our Song Ji Sun tells us more. The days of automakers busily building new plants in emerging markets may soon be over, with demand slowing in those nations and the growing need to create more homegrown jobs in their own nations. The Korea Automotive Research Institute says auto demand in the BRIC nations, Brazil, Russia, India and China, is expected to sag this year, especially when compared to recovery seen in developed markets like the U.S. and Europe. The Russian market is slumping at the fastest rate. It's projected to shrink 29 percent this year, marking negative growth for the third consecutive year. China, the world's largest auto market, still boasts annual demand of 20 million units, up 8 percent from last year, but that's slower than last year's 11 percent expansion. With emerging markets slowing, some leading automakers are going back to their roots. Ford, for example, relocated its Mexican truck factory to Ohio last year, following the U.S. government's decision to give auto firms incentives for creating new jobs in the United States. Japanese automaker Nissan also announced it was bringing operations at its rogue factory in the U.S. state of Tennessee back to Japan. That said, Korean automakers Hyundai Motor and Kia Motors are still expanding their production output overseas. Domestic demand in Korea is limited and they're looking to catch up with global automakers in terms of annual production units. Song ji -sun. Arirang News. Korea's Incheon International Airport celebrates its record 10th consecutive year as the best airport in the world for service. The Airports Council International gave Korea's largest airport a near-perfect score of 4.97 points out of 5. It also ranked first in other categories as the facility was named the top Asia-Pacific airport as well as the top big-size airport. Incheon International Airport was included in that category for the first time as it reached the 40 million passenger mark in 2013. A total of 1,800 airports participated in the survey. Now, when we think about Korea's rapidly aging population, many of us get worried as the experts have warned that the aging population could pose a serious threat to Korea's economy in the future. But for some people, it's an open field for business opportunities. Connie Kim takes a closer look in this week's Industry Insight. 
Come 2026, about a quarter of the nation's total population will be 65 or older. Now zeroing in on this lucrative market, Korea's medical machinery industry is targeting the silver generation. The domestic medical device industry has been growing about 5% annually over the past six years, topping 4.2 billion U.S. dollars in 2013. And it'll only increase as demand rises with the changing senior demographic. But it's not a surge in cutting-edge operating room hardware that's leading the way. Looking at the most recent data, the top manufactured devices were dental implants devices and dental alloys used in fillings. About 9 out of 10 seniors in Korea are implant recipients. The country's leading dental x-ray manufacturer, Vatec, is just one of the many companies that see the potential for this market and is aiming to cash in. It's important to use accurate dental x-rays, especially for seniors, considering that implant surgery comes with high risk. We expect a surge in demand for our x-ray machines. And another fact, one in five seniors are known to be suffering from diabetes. Green Cross MS, a company that specializes in diagnostic tools, recently acquired a blood glucose monitor maker. The company says it's a landmark deal that'll help it focus more on developing technology for the elderly. This will help us access the ubiquitous healthcare market. We are currently doing research on how a smartphone could be used to track heart rates, cholesterol, and hemoglobin levels. Medical devices are evolving, going smart and high-tech. Analysts forecast the industry will continue to head towards helping older generations. Medical machines have gotten smaller, small enough for elders to carry around. If the technology to send data from these medical machines to hospitals are developed, a new ubiquitous healthcare industry will open up. Korea's changing demographics are affecting how the local market will expand. In the past, medical advancements and devices squarely focused on curing people and saving lives. But now, the landscape of the industry is shifting towards helping people live healthier and longer. Connie Kim, Arirang News. Now, shifting to the Ukraine crisis, reports of heavy fighting has jeopardized a fresh ceasefire in the east of the country, less than 24 hours since it went into effect. With more, we turn to Paul Yi at the News Center. Paul, this conflict between government forces and pro-Russian separatists has raged on for nearly a year. And despite assurances from the Russian president just a couple days ago, this latest truce appears to already be falling apart. That's right. Both sides are blaming the other for breaking what was supposed to be a long-term ceasefire in Ukraine's eastern war-torn region. Now, that deal, of course, was brokered last week in Minsk between the leaders of Germany, France, Ukraine and Russia. The foreign ministry in Kiev said Monday that its armed forces have been under fire from separatists over 100 times in just the last 24 hours. Despite the diplomatic breakthrough, Ukrainian lawmaker Hanna Havko says her country needs the support of international allies to keep the peace. Of course, we do not have illusion and we are not too naive because after signing the Minsk in September, we saw how many people, among them children and civilians, were killed. So this is why it's important for Ukraine now to accumulate and to generate international support to get defensive weapons to protect our territories. Meanwhile, the renewed violence has prompted the European Union to follow through with its warning that it would push fresh sanctions on Russia. On Monday, the EU imposed asset freezes and travel bans on 28 people and organizations it says are involved in Ukraine conflict. They include Moscow's deputy defense minister as well as prominent Russian singer and lawmaker Isov Kosbon. And turning to Egypt, the military says it's bombed several Islamic State targets in Libya. This after the release of a video appearing to show the brutal execution of a group of Egyptian hostages by militants allied to the Islamic State group. Cairo's foreign ministry has called for tough intervention against the terrorist organization, describing it as a threat to world peace. Our Connie Lee has more. 
Egypt is striking back. Its military said on state radio Monday that its warplanes have bombed militants in Libya affiliated with the group calling itself Islamic State. This just hours after Egypt's president vowed revenge for a video appearing to show the mass beheading of 21 Egyptian Coptic Christians by the IS terrorists. Egypt reserves the right of retaliation and with the methods and timing it sees fit for retribution from those murderers and criminals who are without the slightest humanity. Egypt's military said its planes had targeted weapon reserves and IS training camps in Libya. The horrifying five-minute video released Sunday shows the victims, all male and wearing orange jumpsuits, being marched along a beach before being simultaneously beheaded by terrorists in black masks. The video is called a message signed with blood to the nation of the cross. And as the killings take place in Libya, it's raising concern that the militant group is expanding and has an affiliate outside of the group's core territory of Iraq and Syria. The U.S. has also condemned the terrorists for the killing of innocents, saying it is just the most recent of the many vicious acts they've committed. The victims who were working in Libya were kidnapped by the terrorist group two months ago and have ignited demonstrations in Egypt with protesters urging the government to take action. Thousands of Egyptians are said to have gone to Libya in search of work since the Arab Revolution there in 2011. Connie Lee, Arirang News. And finally, Japan's economy has managed to pull itself out of a recession. A new government report shows signs of rebounding growth in the fourth quarter of last year. According to official data released Monday, the country's GDP expanded at a rate of 2.2 percent. That performance, however, was weaker than expected for the world's third largest economy. Chief Cabinet Secretary Yoshihida Suga said it was Tokyo's decision to postpone a second sales tax hike that led to the recovery. Economists predict the current slump in oil prices will translate to a boost in consumer spending, a trend that will likely help Japan continue to grow through the first quarter of this year. And that wraps up our look at international stories for now. I'll see you back here tomorrow night. Hello everyone, I'm Steven Che with the Sports Brief. Now judo is in the mainstream sport in Korea, but Kim Jae-bum is working to change all that with another great outing, this time at the European Judo Open in Italy. The 30-year-old earned the bronze medal in the under 81 kilo weight class after a half-point win over his Russian opponent. Adding that to the gold medal from Bulgaria last week, the reigning Olympic champion now sits firmly at ninth on the world rankings. Meanwhile, fellow countryman Kim Zuan earned the over 100 kilo bronze to bump him up a spot to 25th in the world. And heading to the KBL hardcourt for the lone matchup, let's go down to Busan for the tip off. The KT Sonic Boom hosted the ET Land Elephants and managed to build a nine point lead by halftime. Kim Young Zhu and Kim Zung Won blew away the competition, leading KT to the win that snapped their five game losing streak. And flying over to pro volleyball for two matches in Taejeon. First to the ladies, the Korean Ginseng Corporation beat the Hungkuk Life Pink Spiders in the five-setter for their first win in or over a month. Coincidentally, last month's win also came against the Pink Spiders. And for the men, the top-ranked Samsung Hwaje Blue Fangs glided past the Korean Air Jumbos in straight sets. Leo was great, serving up five aces as Samsung continues to create distance at the top of the standings. And moving on, the World Taekwondo Federation and the International Taekwondo Federation are continuing to deepen their collaborative efforts and build trust. WTF President Cho Jung-won confirmed the Monday that they were still waiting for a response to an invitation extended to ITF President Chang Ung and 20 members of its demonstration team to attend its world championships in May. Relations between the rival bodies have been warming up since they signed a historic IOC-mediated accord in China last August. And that's all I have for sports. Your weather's up next. Good night. Hello, 
and welcome. I'm Kim Bo Kyung with the weather outlook. At the moment, snow and showers are falling in most parts of the country, and over 20 centimeters of heavy snow is expected in Kagodo Province, where a heavy snowfall watch has been issued. Rain is also falling along with the snow, with 5 to 20 millimeters forecast to drop over the Chungcheongdo and Jeollabukdo provinces. Conditions should mostly clear up by tomorrow afternoon, with daytime highs forecast to peak from between 4 to 10 degrees. And looking ahead, mild conditions will continue through the Lunar New Year holiday, but do keep in mind that another bout of showers is set for the weekend. On to tomorrow's readings. Seoul peaks at 6, while Daegu hits 7. Meanwhile, Teju reaches up to 9, Dokdo reaches 6. That's all I have for you now, but I'll see you soon. Thanks, Paul Young, and that's primetime news for this Monday. Thanks for watching. I'm Sean Lim. And I'm Ejun. Have a great evening, and we'll be back tomorrow at the same time.